just getting some things making sure we're working okay so we're just testing here for a few seconds and we'll wait a few more seconds to see if we have uh, some more guests logging in Okay, very good. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Gorilla Searching, Find What You Want and Know What You Found. This is part one of a two-part series. Uh, this session is part of a series of webinars that is offered every week or two by the Stark Portage Area Computer Consortium, or SPARC for short. SPARC is an informational technology center, or ITC, in Northeast Ohio. We support about 30 school districts. However, this webinar is open to everyone, and we'd like to welcome all people who have joined us live today or are watching the recording in the future. My name is Anthony Luskery, and I am the Technology Integration Specialist at Spark, and I will be your presenter for today's session. Along with my colleague, Eric Kurtz, we make up the Spark Technology Integration Department. The link to our department uh, for all of our resources is http ti dot apps apps dot spark dot org so ti apps dot spark s p a r c c dot org and that'll take you to all of our resources and I'll be showing you that link uh, throughout the session here. For today's specific web webinar, there is a special URL, and it is at tiny.cc slash spark, S-P-A-R-C-C, 203. So it's tiny.cc slash spark 2003. And I would encourage you to go to that site if you have not already done so. If you're watching a, lot, a recorded version, please pause the video so you can go to that site and download today's handouts and resources. tiny.cc slash spark2003 will take you to our technology integration site where you will find all the resources for this session, including the live video stream, which will become the recorded video after this session, help guides, live session chat document, a session evaluation, and a short quiz that you can take to earn one hour certificate of attendance for attending today's session or viewing it in the future. Uh, you have to forgive me because my usual equipment is out of the office today, so I've pieced together a couple little uh, pieces of technology here, and hopefully we'll be able to get through things fairly smoothly with what we have today. While you're there at the tiny.cc.spark2003 site, you may want to check out the professional development schedule for upcoming events, 
uh, for recorded trainings of lot previous webinars. And you may also want to sign up for our Spark Lines newsletter. This newsletter will help you stay up to date on our latest technology integration information. And finally, if you need to get in touch with us, you can find our contact information under the contact menu link. So back to today's presentation. The first thing I promised during our presentation is that I would provide you with the end of the slideshow. I would provide you with five simple things to immediately improve your searching success. And of course, as a teacher, your student sorts searching success. And also I strongly suggest you share this with your spouse, siblings, children, etc. As I mentioned earlier, we're part of the tech technology integration department at Spark, and you can get to all of our resources from the link on the page here, ti.apps.spark.org. Our first trick in becoming a better searcher is a rather simple one. Never use a single word to search. Uh, chances are very great that you will not find what you exactly want, and you may be shocked and possibly embarrassed by what you do find. Almost every word that you can think of has multiple meanings, and you may find the meaning that you are not really looking for. So, for example, I've done a search for the word bears, and guess what I got? I was looking for this kind of bear, the American black bear, as you'll see on the left, but instead the page was complete, first page of the search was completely filled with information on the Chicago bears. So you notice my one word was not very successful. Um, you quickly can see from this that if we would include a couple other words or change some of the words, we would have had more success. So the second item on the list of becoming a better searcher is to choose the, choose the best words for your search. And you might ask, what are the best words? There's a large group of different categories, but we'll just go over a few of them for today. The first one is words that are technical terms. So for example, if I would have used the genus and species of the bear I was looking for as opposed to the word bears, it would have gotten me very quickly to the desired subject, it would have skipped all the Chicago Bears, all the Bernstein Bears, all the movies about bears, and would have got us just to the information on the particular animal I was looking for. Um, other technical terms you might use would be scientific terms, um, biological terms. Again, genus and species are great for living organisms, for plants, etc. Our next category are words that are unique. My name, Luscre, L-U-S-C-R-E, is a rather unique last name. There's only probably about 50 or 60 Luscres in the United States, and there's probably only a, maybe two or three Anthony Luscres in the U.S. So it's very easy to find my name when I search for it. But if your name happens to be John Smith, uh, you probably will not show up on the first page of the search, um, and it makes it a lot more difficult. So we want words that are unique. Now, sometimes we can take a very common name and add some additional information to it that makes it unique. So, for example, you might say John Smith and provide a city, state, phone number, license plate number to your car, things of that nature. So you're becoming a more exclusive item to search for. Whenever we want to look for exact phrases, we place them in quotations. And exact phrases are very good as long as you're using the right exact phrase. If your phrase is wrong, your search, of course, will not be very successful. But when you're looking for quotes or you want exact things, so if I want just information on the Chicago Bears, put a Chicago space Bears in parentheses would give me information on Chicago Bears, similar to if I would put um, black bear in the quote marks, again, my chances would be increased. We can also choose to avoid words. Sometimes the best words are the words we don't want to see. So for example, with that search earlier, I could simply place 
in addition to bears, another entry with a minus sign and the word Chicago after it. So that would illuminate searches that had Chicago as part of the returned answer. Now there's quite a few of these different best words and in our second session uh, coming up later in January, we will go over a wide variety of best words to choose for your searches. Now, you may ask, where can I find the best words? Well, I already mentioned before that genus and species names and technical terms are very good. And a really good place to find those is a quick search of Wikipedia. Now, you notice that there's a footnote after Wikipedia. Wikipedia foot has a foot footnote of one. We will get to that footnote later. But just I want to interrupt for a few seconds and say that many of you may think that Wikipedia is a horrible website to search on. Many of you may think it's a great website. I'm going to tell you right now that it very much depends on the subject you're searching for. But one thing I can guarantee is that it's a great place to find genus and species names or technical terms to get you started quickly in your search. The second area we can find the best words is you can go to a trade group, an authority on the subject, something like the American Association of X, Y, and Z would have all the technical terms for all the X, Y, and Z products that might be out there or you might go to the American dentistry to find out what the technical terms are they use for different teeth in the mouth, medical terms, etc. So by going to some of these specialized sites first, you can get the exact terms that you want to search with. Most importantly, probably though, is the fact that you keep getting better words as you search. So from your first search, you will probably find included either in the titles of the section, the page, or in the description of the page, additional words that you may want to add or additional words that you may want to subtract. So those are very helpful in your from your first search. Our third key to quickly improving your searching capability is to remember that the first search or searches are only to find the words for your most successful search. And that's why they call it research. So you have to remember that when you do a search quite often, don't expect to find the best answer the first time. You might find an answer, but it may not be the best answer the first time. So be willing to do multiple searches to find the exact words you want, to find the words you want to exclude, and that will give you a much better chance of having a successful search. The fourth tip is to learn how to quickly review the search results and sites found for the best possibilities. So if we would do a search, we will typically, let's use Google search in there for example, we would typically get multiple pages of search results. And they'd be arranged in a different order depending on how the particular search engine chooses to rank them. Now, a lot of people will tell you that they know exactly how they're ranked and what's at the top of the page. I can guarantee you that no one has the exact secret because they are extremely guarded trade secrets and they are constantly changing. They are the algorithms that determine where sites appear in the search results. There are a number of things that you can do to improve your site ability to appear on the first couple pages or even at the top, but they're not sure far. So you have to remember that even though a site might be listed first, it may not be the best site. So we need to be able to learn how to quickly review the results we find. You probably don't want to look at all four, four million pay, uh, entries. So uh, if you want to look for four million entries, that's fine. You don't need to worry about this next tip. But if you do want to, I, I would strongly suggest that you try this tip. So what I've done is I've done a search and to make it a little easier to see, I've actually placed the column of search results in two separate columns. I just cut the page off the bottom. And I searched for The Art of War, which is a famous book by Sun Tzu. And I wanted to give you an example of what we would look at or what we would see in a typical Google search. And I will try and move my mouse around. Hopefully, you'll be able to see my mouse. But if not, I will try and be descriptive of what I'm talking about. You notice that each entry is made up of basically three portions. Uh, the title of the article or the web page, 
the green section, which is the URL or web address of the site. And the third one, the gray or black, is the description of the website. You may also have some additional items below that, but for right now, we're not going to be concerned with additional items. So we're mainly concerned with those three items. Now, I'm going to pause a second and let you guess, and only you will know, which of these are probably the most valuable to look at first when you get to a page. Okay, time's up. Well, many of you may have thought it was the big print, the big blueprint, the title, but it actually is not. Probably the most important thing to glance at first to quickly evaluate pages is to look at the URL or the green section. For example, when I look at our second entry here, I see immediately that the URL says Amazon.com. So what that probably tells me, that's probably a good place if I want to buy a book or if I want to buy the book. Well, you know what? I might want to read the book sometime, but today I just want information right now. So I know that that Amazon choice is probably not going to do what I want it to do. At the other extreme, if you look down near the bottom, you'll see that the Art of uh, Sun Tzu's full document documentary is actually has an address of YouTube. So we know very quickly that that is a video. So that might be very good to watch. But if we needed to get text or we were doing a report, it may not be the best route to go. But if we did want to watch a video, that points us to a video. So you notice in most cases, the green quickly gives us an idea of the nature of the entry. If we look at our first entry here, we see it's a Wikipedia entry. Very common that Wikipedia entries are near the top. Well, again, we'll talk a little bit more about Wikipedia at the end of this. And you'll notice each of these has different things. When we see www.imdb, I can tell you that that means that is a movie. Now, you might say, Anthony, how do you know that's a movie? Well, I know that from years of looking. And if you don't know, you can click on that. You very quickly find out that it is a movie site. And you notice it got a ranking of uh, three out of five stars. Um, and it tells you a little bit about the movie. Now, if you notice... Our next section that's most important is probably our black section or our gray section. Because if you notice here, under the Art of War, created in 2000, it doesn't have anything to do with ancient China. So it's obviously not dealing with the original document we're looking for, the Art of War from Sun Tzu. Because it says right here that they're an operative for the United Nations, so that means it has to be after 1949. So again, Green first, black second. And then our last thing that I want you to look at is the blue. And the blue catches your eye very quickly, but it's probably the least informative of the three different things on the page. So, in summary, on how to quickly review the pages that you find, I would always first take a look at the green, take a look at the black, and then take a look at the blue. And I think you'll find that very useful. And again, throughout this webinar today, I'm going to give you a lot of ideas that probably won't seem very, make a lot of sense until you actually try them out. This is a webinar where you need to actually try them out. So please, if you're watching the recorded version, please feel willing to pause at any point in time, go out and try some of the things I'm demonstrating here or talking about here, and you will see very quickly. If I was sitting down next to you and doing this webin doing this in person as opposed to a webinar, I would always stop and we would actually go and do these exercises. So number five, sometimes you go through the whole process. I found the best words. I think I've probably found the best page. But when I get there, I can't even find the word or phrase that I'm looking for because there's so much on the page that it's hard to find it. So wouldn't it be great if there was a search engine inside of a search engine? Well, let me tell you a little secret. There actually is. It is our friend, the keyboard shortcut, Control-F. So if we hold down the Control key and press the F key and release them both, it will pop up a small searching window or also what's called a find window. Now, depending on which browser you're using, this will appear in a different spot. If you're using Chrome, it will appear near the top right-hand side of your browser. If you're using 
Firefox, it would appear near the bottom left-hand corner. And if you're using Internet Explorer, depending on which version you have, it will probably be floating somewhere in the vicinity of the upper left-hand corner. So again, same sort of technique, and you'll see that Control F brings up a little search window. So what I've done is I've taken a screenshot on the next page, showing an example. So I went to one of the pages on the Art of War, and I was interested in finding the word sun, because I know that's the author. So what I did is I typed in the word sun, and you'll see that it told me there's nine, there's 18 times that this shows up. Now what have, would have happened is if I would have continued to type here, and then I typed in the word D for Sunday, this article may not have the word Sunday in it, so automatically this would turn orange or red or beep at me and let me know that there were zero cases of that word being found. In this case, we found quite a few. We found 18, and if I click on the little up and down arrows, it will jump through each of the items. Now, what it also does is it also highlights each of them in a yellow gold, or golden color, sometimes an orange color to show you where they're at. And I can simply click through this and see the various times it occurs. Now I want to point out down right, down right below the introduction that if the letters are part of another word, they will still show up because it's not looking just for that word. If I would type in S-U-N space, it would eliminate this word, of course, because it would be looking for a Z, and then, of course, it would have space. So control F, just remember it as your friend. Now, there's something really neat about Control F, and that is the Control F not only works in computer in browsers when you're doing internet searches, but it works in almost every computer program. So, if you're using Excel, if you're using Google Docs, if you're using Microsoft Word, almost every program supports the Control F function. Now, if you have a Macintosh, it's a Command F function. Um, as opposed to a control F function, but it basically does the same thing. And on a lot of keyboards, you can also press the F3 key instead of the control F, but I just don't remember that because there's so many F keys up there. It's just so remember to remember the control F is my friend. So what I've done here is I've summarized all five of the simple things you can do to improve your searching success. And I hope you will try these. Uh, let's go through them real quickly here. The first one, of course, is never use a single word to search. Choose the best words for the search. Remember that your first searches are to find words and to find information so that you can have the most successful search. And that's why we call it research, if you want to remember that, that little part. And again, we need to be able to quickly review the sites we found for the best possibilities. Just think green, black, blue. And again, Control F helps us to find words I want on the page. Now, if you notice, on Control F, I have a footnote here. So let's get to our footnote section of the article. And the was keyboard shortcuts. Now, many of you may know keyboard shortcuts, many of you may not. But let me tell you that if you understand a few basic keyboard shortcuts, it really makes things easier no matter what type of computer you're using, whether it's a Mac, Linux, Windows, or even a Chromebook, in some cases some of the tablets. Most of these things function on almost every computing device. So probably the most important in all the world is the Control Z, because that undoes the last mistake you've just done. You probably all know about Control C for copying. You might know about Control X, which is similar to copying, but it removes the text. And of course, it can't remove from a web page, but it removes it from a word processing document. Control V. And then Control F, which we talked about earlier. I've also th thrown in three more at the bottom. Control A, which selects all the text on the page. Because if you want to copy it, you must highlight it first. And Control A is a quick way to highlight it all. And sometimes when you do different things on your computer, especially in an online program such as Google Docs, you may not see something immediately show up after you've created a document. By hitting F5, that refreshes the browser window and shows you the new contents. And then the last one on this list is Control Tab. That'll cycle you through the various windows that are open on the um, computer at the time that you're using it. So you might have multiple windows. I tend to have many, many windows. So let's look at footnote number one now. I'm sorry, before we go there, I have three more sets. And you'll notice these are each are hyperlinked. 
for some more keyboard shortcuts. One that's specifically designed for uh, browsing and for Gmail. One that is very common keyboard shortcuts. Another one that is shortcuts for Excel and most of the spreadsheet programs. Now I mentioned that we talk about Wikipedia, so let's get to that section now. And a lot of people want to know, should I use Wikipedia, should I not use Wikipedia? So let's go back to our little link here, and we should be able to pop out and see this, hopefully. This is a little document that I put together a few years ago, and it's a Google Doc, and it is shared, so you'll be able to view it. It may take a few seconds for it to load. And I may even need to zoom in here a little bit to make it a little more visible, so we're going to have to be patient. Let me zoom in just a little bit here. So you can see it a little bit. And you can read this at your leisure. But I just wanted to point out a couple things about Wikipedia. Um, and there's a lot of cons that people will quickly tell you that anyone can edit it so authority can be questionable. It's always changing. Well, everything on the web is always changing. And sometimes people post accidentally or intentionally misleading wrong or incomplete information. But there are many pros to Wikipedia. One of the first ones is that many times editors of the columns are experts in the field. And we'll talk about that in a few more seconds. Also, it's, con it's constantly being refreshed. And there's also people that spend a lot of time in each group watching to make sure that people don't change things. Now, one thing about Wikipedia that's great that you will find on not find on most websites is it has footnotes. Those footnotes is, footnotes can be good starting points for searches in addition. So I'm not saying use Wikipedia as your end result, but it's a great way to get there. Also, most people don't realize that you can use all the material on Wikipedia without violating copyright, which is not the case on most websites, although many of our students think that they are. And in addition, you can actually create your own booklet using Wikipedia articles. And because there's no copyright on it, you can distribute that book as a PDF. You can create an ebook. You can share it with your class. So there are a lot of interesting things that you can do with Wikipedia that you may not have realized before. So let's first of all talk about Anthony's rule of thumb for Wikipedia. And basically what happens is the more esoteric a subject is, usually the better the quality of the information. So if I talk about the old Snell Darter of New Zealand, who writes about that? Well, probably people that are pretty interested in the scientific exploration of that specific genus and species, um, probably not casual readers. But what happens is as our subject becomes more and more popular culture or more and more common, you notice that the reliability drops off very quickly. So if we were to look at a pop celebrity who writes about that, well, maybe it's 13-year-old students or maybe even younger, maybe 9-year-old kids. So maybe they don't, they're not really the kind of resource that we get with our Snell daughter authors who, authors who may be doctorates in the subject area. So that's just my rule of thumb. The next section is something that most people don't realize. Wikipedia has a simple version. This is originally designed for people that have li limited English skills. English is a second language, but it works wonderfully to utilize with students who have a lower reading level when they're in elementary grade, elementary grades. Also, I mentioned you can create a book, and we won't go into the details on that, but you can go to the website on Wikipedia and you can actually create a book with different chapters that you'd like. So that's all for the Wikipedia section. And those are the five quick ways that you can improve your searching. So please give these a try, and I think you'll find them helpful. We're going to get started into our next section of the talk now. And that is we're going to talk about a technique that I've developed over the years called recursive web searching. Now, if you got a chance to print out the handouts ahead of time, I would strongly suggest that you take out your handout right now. And the one you're going to want to look at is the one that looks similar to this. Now, unfortunately, on this page, you can't see the whole thing because it's designed to be printed in 11 by 17 format. 
And even if I would do it by 11, 11 and a half by eight, it wouldn't fit on this web page. And we're going to look a little bit at this chart. We're not going to complete this chart today. This is part of the process we're going to stretch over the two sessions. But I want to get you started on it so maybe you can pr practice with it a little bit and see what it's all about. Now, you notice that it starts at a point up here and it goes through a series of events and it goes down to the bottom. We'll quickly go down there. And you'll see that if we find the answer we want, we're done. But if we don't, it brings us back up through a series of steps again. That's where the term recursion comes from. We're recursively looking. As we find information, we ask ourselves, do we find what we want? And do we know what we found? If we have not, we continue this process. So for example, we're going to skip the first part and go directly to the word portion because we've been talking about that a lot today. So choose the best words for the search. After you do that, you do a search and you would see pages. You would quickly preview those pages. And if you're not finding the information you want, that means you need to find new words. So you come over here to the right and it says find new words to add and or new words to exclude. In the salmon colored section to the right upper in the upper right hand corner, this describes a number of word types that are extremely helpful in finding what you want. And um, some of them are very simple, like adding additional words, um, excluding certain words. But then we start talking about the same things we talked about in our simple tools, technical terms, exact phrases, stop words. Uh, let's uh, stop, though, no pun intended, but let's stop for a second and talk about stop words. Now, when you were in grade school and you went to the library and you learned about how the books were shelved in the library, you learned that nonfiction books were put in alphabetical order. Um, and a lot of you were very surprised to find out that a book that started with the word the was not in the T's, or a word that, book that started with the a uh, was not in the A's. And that's because certain letters, certain words were excluded from this sorting process. Because there's so many books that begin with the word the, it'd be very confusing and very difficult to tell. Web pages and web search engines do the same sort of thing. They refer to them as stop words. When I say stop, that means it's a word that is ignored by the specific search engine you're using. And we'll talk about a variety of search engines later. But examples of stop words in web searching include the typical the, a, uh, and um, Roman numerals, like the number one, number two, um, in Roman numerals would be excluded. So that means if you're looking for King James II, it's going to ignore those two I's after King James. Uh, we'll talk about how to solve that in a second. Another area that you might want to choose some words from is part of the web address. Now you might say, Anthony, why would I possibly want part of the web address? Well, if I have a good idea that maybe the page I want is on a website, but I don't know that specific page, by including the web address in the search, that will limit the search results to pages that ha come from that website. So if I found something that was on trains.com, but I didn't find the exact information I want, I might add trains.com to my other search words to try and narrow in on the word I want. Operators are a very special group, which we'll talk about in our next session. Operators are words that allow us to find out very special things about websites. Some quick examples of operators are links to. That would show you all the links that come from a site and go to other sites. Links from would show you all the other sites that link to that site. Now, these are not only helpful in finding the information you want, but these are extremely helpful in knowing what you found because they help you determine why the information is there, who put it there. Uh, unique text. I already mentioned the fact that unique text is very helpful, so an uncommon last name is a very unique text. But there are some things that are pretty much extremely unique. For example, phone numbers. When you include the area code and the entire phone number, it's a pretty unique number. Now, it may vary because the number may be used in a different country. But in that one country, it is only used once. So if you know add the country code, that would even make it more exclusive. So 
a phone number is a pretty unique form of text that might help you to find what you want. A zip code is a fairly unique set of text. By the way, just a trivia question because most people that love the search love trivia. Zip codes weren't put in effect until the mid to late 60s, I think approximately 1968. So even though many of you think zip codes have existed for a long time, those of us that are a little older do not do realize that zip codes are a fairly recent phenomena. And the plus four zip code is even a more recent phenomena. Now, the third one on our list, SS pound, means social security number. Now, social security numbers, as you know, are unique to an individual. Now, they are very helpful. If you have the social security number and search for it, you're probably going to find the right person. On the other hand, you're very unlikely that someone's want to, going to want to provide you with a social security number because of the risk involved with fraud if you would have it. So you sometimes, even though the text is unique, you may not be able to get a hold of it. Now, license numbers. For example, license on your car are unique to your state. Um, the license numbers that are used for the call letters that are given by the FCC to all radio, television stations, and airplanes in the United States and around the world are unique. As a matter of fact, each country has a unique set of license prefixes that they use. So, for example, in the United States, you might listen to, you might watch the television station WKYC in Cleveland. Well, the W is indicative of the prefixes for the United States. The other prefix is commonly, the other two prefixes that are commonly used in call signs for the U.S. are the letter K, which were traditionally found west of the Mississippi for television, telephone and radio stations, and the letter N, which were traditionally found in the numbers on the tail of the airplane, which gave you the license number of that airplane. So call letters and license numbers are very helpful. ISBNs. If you're searching for books, the 13-digit or the 10-digit ISBN can be very good ways to find exactly the book you want, and it can also help you when there's multiple editions of the same book or multiple formats of the same book. Uh, SQUs, that's that little barcode that we see on all of our food, on all the items we buy at the store. Again, those are somewhat unique to the manufacturer or to the store, but they often are unique enough that you could find it. So let's say you're looking for some information on repairing a piece of equipment that you purchased at the store, and you start finding when you search for the name, you're not having much success. But if you put in the SQU, it'll tell you the exact model in a lot of cases. A serial number, again, is very helpful, but a lot of times those serial numbers, they're reused, so you sort of need to know what it goes along with. But if I would say that I had an Acer computer with a serial number of blah, 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 you could probably go on an Acer site and find the exact model of that computer. The last two are terms that are used quite a bit in databases. Some of you may not be familiar with these. UID is a unique identifier, and GUID is a special type of unique identifier. These are both things that mean that when I tell you that UID, that means it's one piece of information in a database. So you'll see that our salmon area can give us some of the best words we can possibly search with. So once we place these words back into the search again, we would again preview the pages. And if we don't find what we want, we go back and we would look through this section again. Now I mentioned earlier I was going to skip ahead. So let's jump back a little bit here. And let's go back to the very beginning of the chart. And we'll talk, start talking about this. And again, we'll complete that during our second session. On this chart, you start in the upper left-hand corner of the big green box, which says select the best search engine or for the type of search you want to do. And most people say, well, what type? What do you mean multiple search engines? Google's out there. And some people might know about Yahoo. And some people might know about Bing. But that's probably all there is, isn't there? Well, there's actually quite a few more. And I maintain a list on my searching page, searching resource page. And you can get to this page very quickly by using this little shortcut, which I think is on the page here somewhere, hopefully. And if we don't see it, it's tiny.cc slash rsearch, just like the word research, but without the first E. So R-S-E-A-R-C-H will take you to this page. Again, though, anytime you go to the ti.apps.spark.org, 
It'll bring you two links to all of these items so you can find them from there. So you don't really need to remember the URLs for each specific one. But this is my searching page, and we'll talk some more about this later on. But you'll notice right here, you can also download the documents from that we're utilizing today from this page. But what I wanted to show you more importantly today is down below, there's a section called Greater Than 101 Searching and Research Tools. And you notice that these are all search engines or search tools or tools that have to do with search engines. And you notice I keep scrolling here and I'm only up to the letter M. And I could keep scrolling for quite a while, but we'll cheat. We'll go back up to the top because this is an embedded spreadsheet from a Google Doc. I can maintain it very easily, but I can also do some fancy things with it. For example, it automatically counts each time I add a new site. So what started out as greater than 101 sites about five years ago has now turned into 221 sites. Now, unfortunately, sometimes that goes up and down because some good sites go away and some new sites appear. So uh, please feel free to use this list. Now, you might say, well, I don't need that. I have quality search tools. Well, there's some very good tools out there for specific things. For example, there's a tool called anywho.com, a search site called anywho.com. Absolutely useless search site, except for the fact that it helps you find phone numbers. So it's a site that's designed to find phone numbers or to do reverse hookups with the phone number and find a person. So it's very specialized, pretty much does one or two tricks, but it does those tricks well. And you'll see that that's the case with a lot of these sites. They don't do everything, but they specialize in very specific things. So you can think of Google as sort of, you know, your giant Walmart superstore. But sometimes you want to go to a small boutique and get something unique or something you can't find in a giant superstore or big box store. So these little specialized search engines can be very helpful. Also, some of them, some of them can do things that even the big search engines can't do. And we'll talk about that in a minute. First thing I want to show you here, though, is this is a Google spreadsheet. And because it's a Google spreadsheet embedded in here, we can use what's called the filtering function. So if I click on the all, I can choose what category I want. Now, the categories are color coded on the left there. So if I come down here and say I want to find, oh, search engines for education, it will show me search engines that tend to be good for education. So some of you may, if you're in graduate school, may have, may have heard of ERIC, Electronic Resource Information Center, Google Scholar. By the way, th even when we just talk about Google, there's over 10 different Google search tools itself besides the regular Google search engine. And one of them is Google Scholar. And when you use Google Scholar, it looks for scholarly works, books, journal articles, et cetera, as opposed to general literature. And right below, there's another one called Google Squared. But you'll see that there's a lot of different search sites here available specifically for education. And when I'm done with that, I can always go back and say all. Now, one of my favorites, I'm just going to give you a little quick preview of this today, are what are called computation search engines. These are search engines that, not, that are designed to calculate. They pull information from databases, and they give you calculated comparisons. Probably one of my favorites is Wolfram Alpha. Please, before we get back together next time, give Wolfram Alpha a, char a try. It's a great tool. You can put in the name of five countries. It will give you all sorts of statistics for each of the countries and compare them with each other. So it's designed to do comparing, contrasting, to get quantification. And a fun thing to do is pop your first name in there, and it'll show you a timeline of the popularity of that name over time and how many percentages of um, people that are born have that name. So it's a very interesting thing to do. But these are all computation search tools. So there's a ton of different search engines out there. Please don't be a one-trick pony person and only use one. Try some of these other ones out. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. So let's jump back to our recursive web, recursive web searching page again. And again, um, a lot of people always ask me, well, Anthony, do you have this piece of paper sitting next to you every time you do a search? And it's, especially students ask me, so I say, no, no, no. What I do is I've had this paper next to me when I've been searching for a while, and eventually it becomes second nature.
So it's sort of like when the coach, coach draws the X's and O's for the basketball team, they don't take the clipboard out on the court. They bring the information on the court because they've been practicing it. So they know the operation. So this is a great way to get yourself in a habit by practicing searching using a very structured format. So we said select the best, best search engines for the search job that you need to do. The next suggestion is I suggest that you use the advanced search tool of the search engine you choose. So let me show you an example of that real quick. Let's jump out here and let's go to Google. I'm sure you've all seen Google before. And some days there's something really neat on Google, and that's Google Doodles. And Google Doodles are really exciting because you can see really interesting ways that they spell Google with various um, pictures of people or shapes, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what you may not notice on Google, though, is down at the bottom, there's a little innocuous little gray button that says, or wording that says settings. When you click on settings, you will see one of your choices is advanced search. If you click on that, it brings you to the advanced search engine for Google. Now, it looks very really complicated the first time you look at it. You say, well, you know, this was simple, one box. This has all these boxes, so why would I possibly want to go here? Well, the nice thing about using most search engines' advanced tools, and they're available in tools like Ask, being Yahoo, they all have advanced search um, pages. This is real nice because it's what I call a plain English search box or plain text box. It says, I want all these words. You put all the words in there. I want this exact phrase. You can put it in there. No need to worry about quotations, minus signs, plus signs, all that Boolean algebra that you've heard about before of how to calculate or to tell what the word is. So you basically just says, okay, I want all these words. I want this exact phrase or I want any of these words, or I want it to have none of these words. You can also say that I want to have numbers ranging from blank to blank. So for example, I could put it, I want to look for uh, train locomotives, and I might put in here 1890 to 1925, and it will try to limit my searches then to those particular years in most cases. Now, it can not always exact science because as you notice, it doesn't say years, it says numbers. So it could be sometimes dollar figures. Sometimes it could be units you know, of measure. Sometimes it could be years. So there's a whole variety of things. So it's not always exactly perfect. But you'll notice below that then, even if you didn't know all the fancy Boolean algebra to end of these things, directing into this little single box, you still wouldn't have all these extra tools. So for example, if you wanted to find it in a specific language, if you wanted to find it in a specific country or region, if you want to look on a specific website, if you wanted uh, the terms that you're searching for to only appear in the title of the page, you notice that we have a whole large number of extra things here. And if that's not enough, there's even more. We won't go there right now. So the advanced search pen engine, advanced search page of the search engine can be very helpful. Now, over time, what's happened is Google has actually snuck some of these advanced search features onto the main Google search engine. So for example, if we would search for locomotive, as we typically would, you would see a page full of results. Now, many of you probably noticed real quickly that there's also some additional things. I can say I want to search for books. I can say I want to search for images. So we're already getting more advanced. But let's take a look right here at the very last one because this is the most powerful one. Search tools actually bring some of those advanced search tools to the front page. So if I do a web search and then I click on search tools, it gives me criteria in which I can filter down my results even more. So for example, I could say, I only want to find web pages that were updated in the last month. I only want to find pages that are at a specific reading level. I might only want to find articles that have to do with date or by relevance, so I can sort them. Same thing works with images. When I click on images and I go to search tools, again, I get a whole nother set of filters. 
and I can do a lot of different things. I can filter by the size of the image, not the size of the not the size of the locomotive, the size of the image of the locomotive. I can also search by color. So if you want to find all pink locomotives, you can click on there and you will see pink locomotives. Let's clear that out for a moment and go back to any color. You can also choose which type of image you want. Do you want a face? Do you want a photo? Do you want clip art? Do you want a black and white line drawing? Or do you want an animation? Well, someone might say, Anthony, why in the world would I want a locomotive with face? Well, many of you are young enough to have a, have a show that you've enjoyed as a child. And I'm going to let you take a second here so you can guess. But now I'm going to show everyone else that if you click on face, you will probably see a bunch of faces, but one of the faces you will see with the locomotives is Thomas the Tank Engine and his other friends from the railroad. So we can do a lot of different filters on our dot images. Again, we can do by what date. We can do by usage rights. Is this available to use commercially, or do we have to get special permission to use it? Can I reuse it? At, non-commercially, etc. Also, there's a more, there's a additional tools. And then if I have set filters by doing these, so example, let's say I said face and I said green, they will both work together and give me a limited version. I can always clear all those by hitting the clear button. So if you notice, Google has actually snuck some of the advanced features onto the main search page and it's I'm surprised by how many people miss this completely so while we're here let's just look at a couple other real quick things on Google that you may not realize that are there one of them is called safe search and if you click on the first choice it's sort of counterintuitive here but if you click on the first one it will remove or try to remove search items that may be objectionable now, you might say, well, if I had that in a school, uh, kids would never check that because they'd want to see the things maybe that I didn't want them to see. But if you go down to the more about safe, sex, safe search, it'll tell you how to turn it on and then lock it. So once it's locked, someone without the password to that, that when it was locked, won't be able to change it back and it'll remain in the safe search mode indefinitely. So when I click on it, it now says safe search is on. But again, someone could change it back, but you can lock it down. So you can read a little bit more about that on the help section of Google. Now, I just mentioned the help section. I know a lot of you use different search engines. How many of you have ever looked at the help section of your search engine? You say, Anthony, why would I possibly look at the help section? Well. Did you know that Google can do math right here in this address bar? So, for example, if I put in equals three times eight, it will actually calculate it for me. I can also do conversions between different units of measurement, et cetera, et cetera. So I can do a lot of different things from the bar besides just search. So how do I know that? Well, either I fell upon it by accident or I went down to my Google page and I went down to this hidden part down here and I'll notice a couple things here we have a history of how Google works and we have a search help I would strongly suggest that you pick at least one search engine between now and the time we get back together again and take a look at the help section of that search tool and you'll be might be shocked by all the different things you can do with that search engine that you never even realized you could do. So we're almost out of time for today, but let's just jump back real quick for a couple last things so we complete this part of our project. So again, using the recursive search tool, we first select the best search engine for the job and try a couple different ones. Then we go to the advanced searching option page, which makes it easier to do it. We find our words, we look through this different set of words to choose them, and we can be very successful. I just want to mention a couple other quick search engines while we're at it. Um, does anyone ever realize that, okay, one year during the summer, I was shopping for tents on my wife's computer. 
Well, when you do a search on a website, a lot of times advertisements show up on the side of the search, or depending on what search engine it is in different places. So if I were to search here for camping, you would see that I have some advertisements over here for different things, and I have an ad for something up here. Well, a lot of times I might be searching for something completely different, but I'll see tent advertisements here showing up. Why was I seeing 10 advertisements? Because Google, as of most search engines do, they try and what they call make your searching experience more successful. What a lot of people call is they like to keep information about you. So anyone who searches Google will not necessarily get the same results. It depends on who's used the search, who's used that computer before, what they've searched for, and a number of different things. So your search is actually customized to you. Now, sometimes that's very good. Sometimes that's very bad. For example, if I would search for weather, it's probably going to show me weather somewhere in the area where I'm located here. It's probably not going to show me the weather in San Francisco immediately. I'm not near San Francisco. You notice it says Maslin, Ohio. Well, I'm located not too far from Maslin, Ohio, but our internet comes through Maslin, so it just assumes based on my IP address that I'm probably in the Maslin area. Same thing if I would search for search, search for food, I want to buy, go find some Indian food. Well, first of all, I found me a bunch of things. But what I say about searching for a single word, never do that. So let's add something else to it. Here's Indian cuisine. And notice here that there's restaurants. And there's maps of restaurants. And guess what? The restaurants are within a couple miles of me. So what happens is it keeps information on you. Now, let's say I did a search on my laptop for Indian food here, and I got on an airplane and flew across the country and did a search for food there. I might still see some of the original restaurants because it might still think I'm in the same place, or it might notice my IP address and notice I'm in a completely different place and change the settings. So the searches depend on what other people have done with that search engine before. I'm going to leave you with one final thought for today. I want you to try this out. It's a search site called DuckDuckGo. And DuckDuckGo is a special type of search engine. It says over here, protects searching privacy. It does not collect information, set cookies, or look at different things. So if I come here under DuckDuckGo and I search for Indian food, All right. Huh. I don't see anything close by here. Because it doesn't pay attention to our map. Now, if you do search for weather, it does actually still usually look at your IP address and assume that you want the local weather. So it did find the weather for North Canton. And that's based on the IP address. It's not based on what information it's gathered from before. It's based on that specific information I'm gathering now. So um, your assignment, before we get back together again next time, try out a variety of different search engines. Take a look at the help section on one of your favorite search engines. And compare the search results using the exact same search terms on maybe DuckDuckGo and on Yahoo or on um Google or uh, Google or Bing, etc. Oh, and I forgot to mention one thing that I know is on the quiz. So I probably better mention this. Uh, there's a special type of search engine. We've talked about a lot of variety of search engines here. Wouldn't it be nice if one search engine could do what many search engines can do? Well, there's some, something called meta search engines. M E T A. Meta search engines are websites such as Dogpaw. Is a meta search tool. When you search using Dogpile, it actually gives you results from multiple sites. And actually, notice here it says Go Fetch. By the way, just trivia question without looking, what does Google say when you click before you click there? So you notice that it gives us results from a variety of different web pages. Um, 
at the same time. So it's giving us results from both Google and Yahoo. And there's a variety of meta search engines that pull from different main sites. So uh, that's it for today. Please uh, consider signing up for our online for our new newsletter called Sparklines, and we will keep you up to date on everything that's going on. Remember to visit ti.apps.spark.org for any additional information. And uh, please, because we only had one person today, we were not able to handle the live question sheet. Please feel free to go to that sheet and add additional questions, comments, etc., and we will fill those up. Try and have those answered for you by the next session. We will also keep that document live, so even if you don't visit the next section, you can session, you can see the results on there. And finally, if you would like to receive a certification for one hour of credit, please take the small, the short quiz that follows this. And whether you want the hours or not, please fill out the uh, evaluation so we can get a better idea how to serve you best. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop the broadcast in a few minutes. But this is Anthony from Spark saying goodbye and good searching.